and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Good afternoon or good evening whenever you're listening to the podcast. And welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily for Tuesday here in the peg. Big show coming up today. We will have lots of hockey talk and we'll also hit the diamond a little later on. Check in on the Blue Jays, 10 games into the season with Andrew Stoughton a little later on. Of course, we do have a Winnipeg Jets game tonight in Madison Square Garden against Andrew Kopp and the New York Rangers. Uh, early game tonight, Mike McIntyre will jump on. We'll have the uh, latest on the Winnipeg Jets lineup for tonight, and we'll actually get to that in the next couple minutes. But I'm um, just getting Mike's thoughts on where the team is at right now, coming out of the weekend, going into these final half dozen games. Um, and I imagine, like many of the conversations, less about tonight's game and the next week or the next two weeks, and more about what is to come after that in what is expected to be a um, an off season full of change around the Winnipeg Jets. Certainly, I'd imagine that is the thought of many of the fan, much of the fan base. We'll see what Mike thinks about that later on. But while the Jets aren't going to be playing any playoff games in front of white clad fans downtown, the Manitoba Moose will be a couple weeks left in their regular season. And we're getting ready for playoff hockey beginning this weekend on the south side at the Ice Cave. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 Hashtag on Twitter is Rally the Storm and the Winnipeg Ice, the number one team in the Western Hockey League, begin their quest to win a WHL title and compete for a Memorial Cup against the Prince Albert Raiders. Those games go Friday and Saturday, 7 p.m. at the Ice Cave. And really looking forward to having Ice head coach James Patrick on in about 20 minutes or so. Talk about the season past, look ahead to the playoffs, and uh, get the excitement going for the Ice playoff run here in Winnipeg. Um, listen, just before we get Michael Remus in here, big shout out to all the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Wallace & Wallace, F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Breezy Bend, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick & Nicky DQ Group, Canadian Club Whiskey, Cool Bet Canada, and our friends at Aikens Lake, um, of course, Wallace and Wallace, our newest sponsor, Aikens Lake, just uh, we're back with Aikens through the summer. And uh, in addition to, you know, finding a spot to, you know, get out there for a world class five star experience. I talked to Pitt Turan. I tweeted this out earlier and got a nice response from Darren Drager. Uh, if you have a student in the family or you are a student looking for what really is a dream job in the summer working in Manitoba paradise with some of the best people around. Go to AkinsLake.com or check out my Twitter uh, with a link to uh, the ad, or you can hit them up at AkinsLake.com. Uh, uh, they need a couple dock hands, and I believe they're st uh, still looking for one more guide for the summer. And uh, as I've said before, Akins is one of the most special places I've ever been, and I've always been so envious of the younger people that get to spend the entire summer there working and having a great time. So if you do have, there's the, the piece right up if you're watching with us on, uh, on Twitter or on uh, YouTube right now. Um, dock hands, you don't need to have any fishing experience, but many of the dock hands go there, start working the dock, and a summer or two later, they're in the boats as, uh, as the guide. So uh, Pitt Turan, our friend, is the guy to talk to about that. Um, I would not be as enthusiastic <clears throat> about this if I didn't know what an incredible opportunity it was and just how much the uh, young people that have worked there in the past have loved it. So uh, AkinsLake.com, AkinsLake on Twitter, find out more. And if you do have someone that is looking for an amazing opportunity this summer, there you go from your boys at Winnipeg Sports Talk. All right, let's get Remus in here and get this party started. What's going on, dude? How are you today? 
You feeling good? Getting set for another uh, packed night of hockey here. Jets in the against the Rangers. A couple narratives. Morgan Barron, revenge game narrative. Andrew Cuff, <laughs> revenge. They, hey, they talked to Barron today. And one thing I didn't realize about Morgan Barron has, you know, Kyle Connor um, has some really nice flow. Sammy Niku has had a nice head of hair in the past on the Jets. Jets, really good hair. I mean, Blake Wheeler's rocked some nice hair. Morgan Barron. Really nice head of hair. So I think the Jets, one thing, they may not be in the playoffs, but they do have the title of, I think, best hair team in the well, NHL. Kyle Connor has turned into, uh, you know, almost a, uh, the standard when it comes to just yes. elite hockey hair right now. And you mentioned Sammy Niku. I went to that game against uh, Laval a few weeks ago at um, downtown for the Moose. Sammy still maybe has the best hair in all of pro hockey, at least in North America. I mean, it is. It is majestic. Um, in some ways, maybe it's taken away from uh, his play on the ice. People spend too much time looking <laughs> at his hair. Not as much what he can do as a defenseman right now, and it's keeping him in the American Hockey League. I don't know. It's probably not hair-related. All I'll say is, uh, you know, it'll be more about what happens on the ice than how the guys look in the mirror tonight. But I am very much looking forward to seeing. I mean, again, what do these ga games mean? Not much, but... How did the Jets respond from such a miserable weekend in Florida? Um, and, you know, yesterday, a big part of the program was, I mean, not necessarily looking at how discombobulated and disorganized at times they looked in their own zone. And, you know, the, the comments from Paul Stastny of once again hanging their goaltender out to dry. But, I mean, just to see what the, uh, what the commitment level of uh, is from the Winnipeg Jets. Because, you know, again, doing it against lesser competition last week, they hated their first period against Ottawa, as did most Jets fans watching it, uh, but came back with a couple strong periods and won that game. And then in the next game of the back-to-backs, and this, of course, Mark Schreifle was injured in the, uh, in the Ottawa game with a depleted lineup, um, you know, played one of their most complete 60 minutes in a long time. Now then, everything that happened last week, the Seattle game being postponed, the early trip out to Florida... Um, maybe it was conspiring for a team that is essentially out of the playoffs to not be that ready for games. Um, but listen, they've got some familiar faces on the other side. I think there definitely should be a pride factor with this Winnipeg Jets team. And, you know, considering what we heard from the likes of Connor and Ehlers and Stastny coming out of those games, uh, I think it's important for the Winnipeg Jets to, to respond, to put forth a professional effort tonight. Um, you know, as we get into these final half dozen games going forward, because, uh, um, listen, I mean, I appreciated the honesty of those players and what they had to say. Uh, but if you come back and do it again and again and again, um, you know, you wonder what even there is to say going forward and what that means for this group that seems to be pretty much broken right now coming out of that weekend. Yeah. I mean, just hearing, um, you know, Ehlers talk about how they're not playing the right way and Dave Lowry keep reiterating how they want to play and they're repeatedly not playing the way they need to play to win hockey games. It's like a broken record. We've been doing this over and over again. So I'm kind of not really expecting anything different, but you know, with the jets this year, when sometimes when you expect them to lose, they come out and have a nice performance like they did against Colorado a couple weeks ago at home. And when you think they're going to win, you know, they drop a, they drop a dud performance. Um, so, well, I mean, we'll see. I mean, I, I'm kind of curious. Well, Andrew, Co I'm looking forward to seeing Andrew Kopp in a Rangers uniform tonight. He's fit in nicely with Artemi Panarin. As we, someone wondered in chat, will Morgan Barron get a tribute video at MSG? I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. But you know, as far as the lines go, I mean, I don't know if I should be expecting anything different because the Jets going with the same same lines nothing's changed here um you know from last game where they lost well, it's like maurice before. always said you don't break up a winning lineup Reem. yeah connor stasny ehler sanford's been bumped up to the second line with dubois and wheeler bow baron lowry appleton harkins tony natos fetchnikov defense morrissey demello schmidt pionk stanley dylan perfetti did skate briefly yesterday but i don't think he's close safely he's injured so i mean this top six i mean not looking not looking like a playoff team's top six. I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, Sanford moving up for Baron. I don't know what Baron did get moved down. It's possible has they're just playing for next year. Well, yeah. And listen, I don't mind this at all. To be perfectly honest with mm -hmm. you, because you know, as good as Baron looked playing with Stastny and Ehlers um, in that game against the Habs, where he had the goal and an assist, 
I think it is most likely if Morgan Barron is to become a contributing regular on this team next year, it's probably not in the top six. But I think there's a chance that, I mean, they're, they're looking for a guy to fit in with Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton. And, um, you know, we know what Appleton brings to the table. I mean, aggressive forecheck, he gets in on the pucks, not an overly big guy. Adam Lowry certainly is. Morgan Barron brings, uh, you know, a, I mean, a great package. I mean, he can skate. He absolutely can hit and is a heavy guy on the puck. Does a great job of winning some puck battles. I mean, I think the cycle that has just basically disappeared from the Winnipeg Jet game, um, you know, especially with that line that used to do it as well as maybe any line in the league, uh, I think that adds some possibilities to what they can do as far as maintaining possession. And I'll tell you what, in a small sample size so far, we've seen him his ability to both set up his teammates and, you know, capitalize on the, the odd opportunity. So I, I, I'm fine with this. I actually kind of thought that that's where he would be last week, but I was certainly there for him getting the opportunity up in the top six to see what he could do. But if you are looking at what might benefit the team right now heading into next year, let's see what these, these three can do together because uh, I certainly think that that job would be open for somebody in the organization and uh, Morgan Barron is going to have a crack to uh, show management and the coaching staff, the current coaching staff, um, you know, how he can fit in playing with Lowry and Appleton, who uh, were pretty much glued together for the entire 56 game season last year. Yeah, Stanley in Sandberg uh, remains out. As we know, Stan's got to get in, so he's staying in. And Connor Hellebuck starting in goal. I, I do wonder, you know, at what point do you just sit Hellebuck down? Um, they're not officially out of the playoffs yet, Huss. Um, I know Money Puck has it at 0% because their decimals don't go that far. But Micah McCurdy on Twitter had it at a uh, 0.03% chance. So outside, outside shot here, but... I think they can officially get eliminated if the chips, but with a loss and like a Dallas win, I haven't been following. I just follow the percentage and I know that it, I mean, yeah. Well, like, why am I paying attention to the scenarios? They've been out for, they've been out for a couple of weeks. Like, I don't, I don't need to know. <laughs> no, i like, yeah, Dallas listen, gets when, a point it, when or... it is absolutely official and that final <laughs> nail in the coffin is, uh, you know, we'll see that it says, but yes, apparently it's 0%, but there's a difference between 0% and officially being eliminated and, uh, you know, whatever that is. I'll tell you what, though, I want to give credit where credit is due. And I don't think I've ever said this on this program before. I've made a lot of fun of this team in the past, certainly before this season. Winnipeg Jet fans loved every time the Jets played them because they would win every time. I mean, I think it was a stretch going back four or five seasons. The Jets completely own the Vancouver Canucks. This Canucks team will not quit. Um, I watched most of that game last night. Um, the building had a lot of energy in it. Bruce Boudreaux has this team on a six-game winning streak, and we knew that, that the chances of making the playoffs were very, very low. Um, and very much like the Winnipeg Jets, the only thing that could happen is if they went out and got on a bit of a run. And, uh, you know, to the Canucks credit, that's exactly what they've done. Six straight wins, um, two against the Vegas Golden Knights, which were massive victories to get them back into the mix. Yeah, they took care of the Coyotes twice and the Sharks. Uh, but that win last night against Dallas was a big one. They've got the Senators tonight to put it to seven in a row, Reem. And, you know, it's amazing. Credit where credit is due. It's still a long hill to climb and probably unlikely that they make the playoffs. But this push right now, I think, is giving a lot of faith in the future of the Canucks to that fan base. But I'll tell you what, for people that were hoping that the rumors about Paul Maurice being hired in Vancouver uh, were true, I would have to think that this makes it less and less likely and probably more difficult to move off of Bruce Boudreaux for the Vancouver Canucks considering the impact that he's had so far in a very short period of time with this team. You think about the start that they had and now the run that they're on right now. I mean, I don't know how you don't continue with Bruce Boudreaux going forward, and that probably will rankle some people here in Winnipeg that thought he'd be a perfect fit for the Winnipeg Jets. And certainly many of us looking forward to the potential or possibility of Paul Maurice returning to the coaching game elsewhere in a Canadian market. Yeah, because then he'll come back here and there'll be a big tribute video. That's why we would be excited oh, for it. The tribute video. It would for just Maurice. be him. It would just be him yelling at at officials, right? I, there were some classic ones. Um, you know, I, 
You look at that, and I think the report made sense. Um, Jim Rutherford was brought in. I don't think he hired Boudreaux, and his guy is Paul Maurice. And Joe Pascucci said yesterday, they always, you always hire people you know, and he knows Paul Maurice. So I think it made sense. I think it would be hard to go away from Boudreaux. He's had success. I didn't think Vancouver's roster was a playoff roster this year, but you look at their goal differential. Um, it's plus 17 this year. That's the same as Vegas. That's, you know, close to Nashville. So, I mean, they've played well. Hard to, uh, hard to get away from, um, from Vancouver's success and under Boudreaux. Boudreaux. Came in, they were on fire. Bruce, there it is. I don't know how you would say, you know what, we're not going to take a run at this next year. And credit to them, we can look at Money Puck with the playoff percentages. It's not looking good here for Vegas, as you mentioned. Uh, Dude, money. that loss last night, that was the next thing I was going to get. Losing on home ice to New Jersey with what the cool. stakes were last night was an absolutely horrible loss for Vegas. And we've talked a lot about, you know, a lack of, you know, sometimes honesty or accountability around the Winnipeg Jets. Not the case in Vegas. Pierre DeBoer, uh, Peter DeBoer had no problem running both front and wheels of said bus over Robin Lehner last night. But he was, he was right. Like, the frickin' Hamburglar was in net for Jersey, got his first win for New Jersey, making 40 saves against Vegas. And Robin Lehner misplaying a puck that, you know, you should probably have at every level of professional hockey um, and letting in another sort of bad one on the winning goal was the difference. And, you know, DeBoer said after the game, I mean, listen, our, their guy was a lot better than our guy last night, and that was the difference. And uh, I don't know exactly how they're feeling about Robin Lehner. I mean, they sort of bet on him as opposed to Marc-Andre Fleury and the other goalies. They had to put... LB on LTIR earlier this year to get Mark Stone back along with shutting down Nolan Patrick and another player. So they have what they have, at least up until the, there's no salary cap in the playoffs. But the way it looks right now, especially after that game last night, uh, long odds for said Golden Knights to get into the playoffs. And what a disappointment that would be. We've talked about the changes that are expected here after what's happened the last few seasons. If there's one thing Bill Foley will do, he will spend to the cap, he will be very aggressive, and he won't have a long line of patience for losing or missing the playoffs with a lineup like that. So you really wonder if they do miss what this means for the Vegas Golden Knights. Yeah, I remember talking to Gary a couple weeks ago. We talked about all the injuries they had. I mean, they traded for Otak was out, then they traded him and packaged for Jack Eichel, who missed a bunch of games, uh, Pacioretty, Stone, all her, I think Riley Smith out at times as well. Um, so they've definitely battled injuries. And our defense, who's, I mean, we went through their whole team. Martinez missed time. Again, we went, we went through it uh, weeks ago. But uh, it's funny, you know, we talk about Robin Leonard misplaying a puck. I remember Mark Andre Fleury doing the same thing for them oh. in the playoffs, in the playoffs <laughs> last the year. But it seems like um, they definitely, I think like they made the wrong decision here going to Leonard over Fleury. Uh, Flurry having some success with Minnesota. You look at, uh, yeah, I do think Vegas would probably look to make some changes for sure. I mean, talk about disappointments. They were cup favorites coming this year and to miss the playoffs uh, it would be a huge disappointment. I don't think Bill Foley would take that lately, mm -hmm. and I would expect some mm -hmm. changes, or maybe they just run it back and say, you know what, we had some, we had pretty much all of our key players injured, uh, some at the same time. But um, they, sh I mean, you look at them, they should be in, but LA's coming on. They've they're playing really well too. So uh, they're a couple, they're three points back of LA. Mm -hmm. Even going to be, it's tight. It's going to be tight. Huh? It's going to be tight there. No, you know, it like really was. As far as Vancouver, the go that goes though, because I mean, I think this is, a, this is a great story. And I mean, Brudro is such an, uh, a likable dude and an easy guy to pull for. Even if he's coaching a team that you normally haven't liked very much. These are their final six games right now. They've got Ottawa tonight. And again, it is the second night of back-to-backs, but Ottawa's playing last night in Seattle. You have to have that game. Then they go on the road to Minnesota and to Calgary Thursday, Thursday, Saturday. Home games next week against Seattle and LA. And then a quick trip to Edmonton in the final game of the season in a game that, you know, the Oilers could very well be just locked in in their spot. In fact, they probably will be waiting to see who they play. So you never know who might actually be playing in that game or not. So 
I would say, what did you say the number was for uh, for Vancouver right now, Remo, for the uh, for the playoffs? They're at eleven percent. So it's still it's still a long haul, and the and the Kings right now, um, you know, the Kings are playing the Ducks tonight. I mean, that loss last night for Vegas was huge for Los Angeles if they can get it. And I think Edmonton would love to get the Kings in round number one, considering that Drew Doughty, probably their most important player when it comes to playoff time, and a guy that can raise his level of play has been there before, done that, blah blah blah. Uh, he's out for the season. So, I mean, I think you'd be getting an undermanned L.A. team and the Oilers would be a pretty significant favorite in that game. And I don't really care how it works out. Uh, and I don't cheer for either the uh, Oilers or the Flames. But I definitely want the Battle of Alberta this year. Just finished doing the lock shop with Dusty and we were talking after the air, after uh, the show about uh, they, everyone's so fired up about the Oilers and Jay Woodcroft could run for mayor and win in Edmonton right now. I mean, it's been a pretty amazing turnaround considering where their season looked like it was going under Dave Tippett. And, um, you know, he's done an amazing job. There's a lot of excitement about that team, as there should be right now, especially with a very advantageous spot being second in that division, getting third in the Pacific. And then in all likelihood, you're going to have to go and take on the Calgary Flames. But uh, it's been a long time since we've seen a Battle of Alberta. And uh, if we're not going to have any skin in the game other than hoping that the Rangers win a couple rounds to get the Jets a first-round pick, uh, sign me up for seven games between the Oilers and Flames in round two if it happens. Yeah, I'm really impressed with Calgary this year. Has um, Johnny Gaudreau, just an amazing season. Plus 61. For plus minus, which is ridiculous, 107 points in 76 games. One player flying under the radar, Matthew Kachuk. Uh, him and Brady hitting some milestones. Kachuk two points away from a 100-point season, which I don't really think too many people are talking about. And Brady Kachuk scored thir you know, his 30th goal yesterday. So Kachuk bros having a pretty good season. Uh, you know, it's funny. I'm looking at these Gaudreau, Kachuk, Mangiapane, these guys' shooting percentage extremely high i mean over 15 percent. all of them i wonder if they do fall back to earth but when you have you know you know four guys with over 30 goals and you know three of them might even get 40 goals I mean, that's a recipe uh, for a successful team and uh full credit to the flames for this turnaround this year incredible because i was on them last year and they were a horrible disappointment but this year cup con a cup contender for sure i should say them in colorado in the west well well, and you know what? It took a while for people to kind of sniff them out. I mean, we've talked about it. I went on Meanie's show at the All-Star break, um, mm -hmm. and we were talking about maybe a team that wasn't right near the top of the odds that could make a run. And I mean, Calgary was the team. I mean, you got a coach playing a playoff style that is getting results from a squad. You've got a goaltender that has come in and played at an elite, elite level. And that line that you mentioned with Gaudreau <laughs> Lindholm uh, and Matthew Kachuk has been arguably the best in the league. I mean, a plus 61, and, and again, we don't want to get too much into plus minus because it is in some ways a very flawed stat. But over the course of the year, if you're plus 61 putting up the numbers that Johnny Gaudreau was putting up, um, you're having a career year and probably should be in the conversation for the Hart Trophy. And just to give an idea about what a turnaround it was for Johnny over the for, as opposed to the last couple seasons, I mean, last year in that real down year for the Flames, he wasn't even a point-a-game player. He played in every game at 49 points in 56 games. He was a plus two. The year before, he had 58 points in 70 games and was a minus 10. So for him to be at like just about a point and a half a game this year, approaching 40 goals, 70 assists, and to be plus 61... I mean, the number speaks for themselves. I mean, this line has been absolutely uh, devastating this year. And uh, I guess it can give one hope for a team like the Winnipeg Jets that certainly does have a lot of pieces to turn it around. And we've spent a lot of time talking about Daryl Sutter and the job that he's done. You wonder if there's a guy that could have that sort of an effect on the home team here in Winnipeg in the offseason. And who, obviously, the big question is, we'll get a chance to do that. Yeah, that is the big question as we wind down the season here. We're all eagerly awaiting, what, the uh, garbage bag day, the day they clean out the lockers. Who's going to say what? Who may not show up? And I guess what uh, changes uh, we might see ever. And someone's saying, what did uh, Daryl Sutter do to get this out of Johnny Gaudreau? I do have to mention he is in the contract year. Matthew Kachuk also 
deserving of a new deal. He's an RFA after this season, so you have do have to wonder after this year how I think he's a UFA. Oh, is Kachuk a UFA? Oh, oh sorry, Gaudreau. I think you said Gaudreau. Gaudreau's a UFA. Yeah, uh, Kachuk's an RFA. So I wonder how they managed to keep all these guys. Big decision. Manju Pane is going to get a big, big raise too. So those yeah, are, there's those... going to be some raises, but I'll tell you what, there's a good reason for guys to get raises if you have a monster season like that. And now, hey, listen, the last time Calgary had a great year and was first place in the West, they lost in the first round of the playoffs to Cal Colorado in five games. So there still is a lot of work to be done, but it does seem like they're ready. Now, Scott Johnson in chat says, Jets should have hired Woodcroft when Maurice resigned. Can the Jets ever make the right decision? Listen, there's a lot of things you can give the Jets a hard time about. That is not one of them. He was their the head coach of their affiliate. I mean, that much like moving Dave Lowry from the assistant coach's office over, that would have been like moving Mark Morrison uh, from the Moose room to the Jets room. So he was under contract. He was already there. And, and listen, if you want to um, think big picture, I mean, just running in and hiring a coach with one day's notice and saying that's your guy, I mean, for the big picture, maybe it wasn't such a great idea. Now, listen, the rest of this season has not gone well for the Winnipeg Jets, and they didn't get that bump from a coaching change that many of the other teams have seen, and I think that's why there'll be a pretty big search for a guy that can make the right decision going forward. But, um, you know, as much as Jay Woodcroft has done wonders with Edmonton, Edmonton had already hired him. He was already with the group. He was already part of the team. Um, so that's not something you can uh, give the Jets a hard time about, uh, but there are plenty of other things that you can. We're going to talk ice in a couple minutes. Uh, really looking forward to having James Patrick on the program. Um, but first, a big thank you to our newest sponsor, Wallace & Wallace, Winnipeg's fencing and overhead door specialist. You've seen their fences and trucks all over the city because they've been serving residential and commercial customers since 1946. If your property needs the security and protection of a new fence or if winter's done a number on your old one, Wallace & Wallace is there for you. Vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link, or wood, Wallace & Wallace has the right fence for you. And if it's time to replace your garage door, Wallace & Wallace also has Winnipeg's largest selection of overhead garage doors. 204-452-2700. A group of experts, including Ben, Charles, Mark, and the rest of the gang will arrange a time to come out, give you a free estimate, and you can also visit them at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off of Keniston. Um, our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market continue to be the go-to spot for great prices on Winnipeg's best selection of natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries. With some delicious lunch options at the Grab and Go Deli, including Vita Market salad, soup, sandwiches, and more. And you can get ready for the summer barbecues with delicious lean bison steaks or chicken as well. And don't forget that new falafel salad, incredibly popular as well. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge. And if you can't make it into the store, visit their new, brand new, fully shoppable website at myvita.ca to buy online or schedule a delivery with Instacart. Uh, we've got some events coming up. The summer's just about here, folks. And don't be that guy that leaves his new suit until the last minute. You have an event this summer, and if you want a fresh look, now's the time to come and see Andrew and the gang down at F Apparel. It's a great time to do it as well. They've got their new spring and summer fabrics in stock and ready. Over 250 new fabrics in every style, pattern, or color. And of course, with weddings coming up and many other being uh, not consummated, um, confirmed, <laughs> shall we say? <laughs> confirmed, shall we say? Uh, if you're in a wedding party or you've got a wedding coming up, think about F for a great deal, 15% off for wedding parties when you buy your suits over at F Apparel. 190 Smith Street, downtown, and online at F. That's E-P-H, apparel.com. Uh, Mention Aikens Lake hiring right now, so we'll uh, certainly, uh, you can check the start of the show for that, or go to my Twitter, Aikens Lake's Twitter, uh, for looking for dock hands and another guide this year. And, um, well, I'll tell you what, but just before we get James Patrick in, Ken Weeb's coming up on Friday on the program. and. Uh, we may have to do a special Culligan segment for him 
Lots of great feedback on the incredible hydration habits of one Ken Weeb. And uh, listen, if you're talking water in Winnipeg, it is our friends at Culligan Water that are the go-to people for all water services for both home, cottage, and office alike. Water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, and citywide water delivery services, as well as commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Culligan Water is located over at 1200 Sargent Avenue. The number is 694-5180. Give Keegan and the gang a call for whatever your water needs are, or you can find out more online at drinkculligan.com. Family owned, serving the Winnipeg community for over 65 years. All right, coming up in just a second, James Patrick, head coach of the Winnipeg Ice are coming up. Remo, we've talked a lot about the lack of playoff hockey for the Winnipeg Jets, far from it for the Winnipeg Ice. Uh, a lot of excitement. And listen, there was a lot of excitement for last week for the Lambos bobblehead day and the final games of the season. Well, they had to move those to Regina, but maybe not a big deal for the ice organization because it was all about packing the rink and uh, rallying the storm, as they say, as uh, ice are ready to go. Number one team in the Western Hockey League. Uh, big expectations for this club. Um, and there should be after a season like they've had. Yeah, absolutely. Huge series coming up. Uh, first round against Prince Albert. Game one Friday at the Ice Cave at Wayne Fleming Arena, 7 p.m. And against Saturday. Ooh, a little back-to-back -back action in the playoffs. Uh, game two also at 7 p.m. That sounds like a nice way to spend your weekend watching some playoff hockey. And you know about the great players on the ice. Uh, Savoy named, what, Rookie of the Year. So uh, pretty... Incredible season for him, and he mentioned Carson Lambos, uh, Connor McLennan. They got some, you know, NHL prospects on this team, and uh, you know we are disappointed with the Jets, but yeah, we have the ice and the WHL playoffs, which we'll be following along, and then get started on Friday. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, and what a season the ice have had. And and you know, listen, you know, Savoy, um, you know, geeky. I mean, we'll be talking about the draft later on, you know, as we get closer to draft time, and I'm sure they've been thinking of it all year. But right now, it's about the team. Um, and it's about coming behind a team that has just been so damn good all season long. Uh, they deserve to have that rink filled, and uh, hopefully we'll see some great crowds coming up this weekend. Uh, let's get ready for ice playoffs and rallying the storm with the head coach of the first place ice, James Patrick. James, great to have you back on Winnipeg Sports Talk. How are you doing? Uh, how are you feeling with a few days before things get real for your squad? Um, I, you know, I'm excited. I can't wait. Um, but at the same time, when you're a coach, you're, there's a lot of preparation. And I've talked to a few other coaches, and they're not in, in a few coaches uh, in the other league. And uh, one bit of advice they, they've been giving me is you're probably way over preparing and uh, focus on your team. So, but I, I, that's exactly what happens. You want to know everything you can about the other team, even though we've played them eight times and you know them real well. Um, but it still comes down to what what they do well, and then what your team does well, and and you got to focus on on your strengths as much as anything. Well, you guys have done a lot of things well, uh, leading to uh, the number one record in the entire league. First off, congratulations on this season. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know we're all talking about the playoffs, and you probably don't want to focus on the regular season, but it really was a special year for uh, for your group. Um, um, you know, building to this point where uh, it really counts, starting best of sevens on the weekend. Yeah, you know. Um, we knew we were going to, or we felt we had a real good team on paper um, coming out of last year in the bubble, playing 24 games, not losing too many players. We did, we lost our best player, player Peyton Krebs, but we had a really good group of 18 and 19 year olds that were coming back. And we knew um, Savoy was going to rejoin us. Um, last year, this Zach Benson was a total surprise, um, a 15 year old who played the whole 24 games with us. And, um, so we have, we, I will say we've got the real, um, we're fortunate to have that balance of, we have, I would say three elite younger players in Savoy, Geeky and Benson. And then we have a really good older crop, um, you know, maybe led by, uh, you know, Connor McLennan, uh, Carson Lambos, Orzak. And um, you know what, uh, junior hockey goes in cycles. There's the peaks and valleys. And uh, we, you know, we have been building for towards this for the last couple of years. 
You mentioned Peyton Krebs, and it's been really neat to see how he has been part of a bit of a resurgence in Buffalo right now as he gets his feet wet being a, a regular NHLer. But, you know, in speaking with yourself earlier in the year, as well as a few players both on the show and off, his name comes up a lot. We know what an important member of the club he was, but I, I would like to ask you, how much of the fingerprints of Peyton Krebs and the way he conducted himself and helped some of these younger players are on this team this year, even though he hasn't been playing with the club all season long. It's uh, the influence that he had in our organization was huge. Um, he was, you know, he started as a 16 year old. He was captain at 17. Uh, when he was 17, we, we went all young. And so uh, the same uh, class as uh, Cole Muir and, and Nolan Orzak, Jake and Smallwood, uh, Peyton, we also had uh, Owen Peterson and Mike Milne, and those six players were on that team. And we took our lumps, um, and it was a really tough year on Peyton, but um, you're a 17-year-old, you played the whole year against 19, 20-year-olds. The other team's game plan, every game was to run the heck out of them, um, try and run them out of the rink. But it, it just... Um, it brought more attention to his compete and his battle. And, and that was our, our daily talk was as frustrating this as this is for you lead the way by your battle and your compete and you'll, it'll make you a better player, which it did. But um, as far as work ethic, as far as off ice uh, preparation, as far as diet, as far as sleep, as far as, uh, you know, caring for your teammates, um, he, he did those things as, as a young player. And, um, and, the other six players who were on the team who are still on our team now were right uh, shoulder to shoulder with him. And, you know, I, so I know he had an influence on those guys. I know uh, Connor McLennan came up, played games that year. He had a big influence on him. Um, so in, as far as our culture, um, you know, we felt it, it turned the corner when, when Peyton was named captain and we moved forward with, with that group of players. Um, he's close friends with, those players he's an inspiration to those players but they also were looking forward to um having a bigger opportunity and and for them to take more of a leadership role which has definitely happened this year well i mean it's it's high praise for for krebs and i mean i think it's clear to anyone that's followed this club knowing how important he has been um you know really since the day that this club got to well since before the day this club got to winnipeg to be perfectly honest going back to the kootenai days um, but it does seem like, you know, his fingerprints are on it. And, and listen, you know, we've talked a lot and we will continue to talk about the draft eligible players and the great year that Matt Savoy has. Um, but from a coaching perspective, if you could tell us a little bit about the, the veteran leaders on the club that maybe don't get the same headlines as others that, you know, we're going to be so important come playoff time. And Nolan Orzek to me, from what I've seen is at the top of that list. I mean, we might maybe talk a little bit more about Lambos as a first rounder. And certainly he had a phenomenal year, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you what, I mean, if you watch the Winnipeg guys, you can't help, but notice the impact that Orzek has, especially in his own end. And that might not get the headlines, but it has a great effect on the rest of the team. And the bottom line for you, it helps you win hockey games. Yeah, he's a good player. Um, he's, again, another kid that started, he played, uh, I think, seven, eight games for us when he was uh, 16. Really good mobility. And, you know, now this is his, you know, he's played seven, his fourth year, uh, started as a 17-year-old. When I, when I started coaching the league, I, um, I didn't understand, or I didn't realize how important the 20-year-olds are. Um, if you've got good 20 year olds, boy, you're, you know, you are, it sure makes your job easier as a coach. Um, if you've, if you've drafted and developed your 20 year olds and you've had them since you've drafted them at 15, um, it's even better because then they've come up through your system and they know, um, I mean, you, it's more than just a player coach relationship. It's, it's, I mean, you're, uh, and our three 20 year olds are Nolan Orzak, uh, Cole Muir and Jake and Smallwood, they're all, they're men now, they're, they're leaders, they're so respected in the room. Um, Jake and, Jake and Smallwood's the most mature 20 year old I've, I've seen. And he's, um, the way he carries himself, the way he, he lives by his values is, is just, uh, it's ins inspiration to the rest of the team. But so he's, he's almost like a father to some of our younger kids. Um, but all three of them are real good on the ice as well. Like they have to be good players. They have to, they have to play 
important roles. So you start with Orzak, who's, you know, him and Lambos are shut down pair. They play, you know, depending on the opposition, 25 to 28 minutes a game and play in every situation. And um, Smallwood is a really good two-way forward who can skate. Um, you know, he's a guy we, who as a 19 year old had an incredible year, you know, next to Peyton was probably our, our second best player in the bubble. And, um, you know, he's a guy that some pro uh, NHL teams have taken an interest to. And then Cole Muir's a big body, um, just like Jake and he's a versatile player, can play center, can play wing, can win faceoffs. Um, I would say Cole is our strongest player. He's like 210 pounds. He's tough to take the puck off of, um, can play, you know, when, when we're protecting a lead, those guys are on the ice for us. Um, so uh, for me, that kind of says it all. They're, you know, Orzak and, and Smallwood are on the ice when we're down a goal and they're on the ice when we're up a goal. So uh, I, I would use Cole in a little more defensive situations. But I guess to bring it back together, it's um, it's the, the 20-year-olds run the team. And if you got got year old, good 20-year-olds and really good people as 20-year-olds, um, it's going to have a huge effect on the team. James Patrick's the head coach of the Winnipeg Ice who begin their quest for a WHL championship at the Ice Cave on the weekend with games on Friday and Saturday against PA uh, and with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. You, you, you mentioned those, you know, I think Reem and I, one of the games we went to, I believe, was Jack Finley's first game as a, uh, as a, as a, as a member of the Ice after he was traded. And I remember we were having a conversation. At the time, you know, the team was already doing really well. I mean, you knew this was going to be a playoff team and we said, you know, this is this is a trade. I mean, this trade is all about the playoffs. And at that time, you know, it's maybe a luxury to be able to plan ahead when you know your team is that good. Fill us in on Finley, what he's brought to the club, and, and you know, some of the other acquisitions that have joined the team throughout the year and how they fit in going into this first round. Well, you know, I'll admit uh, when we when we brought Jack in, um, I was surprised that. Um, um, Spokane would move them that soon, like, you know, but teams are always, they're looking ahead as well. And they're, you know, the, uh, the trade deadlines earlier in, in this league than the NHL. And, um, but I actually saw Jack when he was 16, um, played against his dad for a long time. Um, but, you know, we were able to get a six foot five center. Who's one of the best centers in the league on faceoffs, who is, um, a guy who can play a really solid two-way game who can hold, like he's really tough to take pucks off of in the offensive zone. And I'm, I'm real big on holding on to pucks and killing time. And, and if you can move your feet and spend more time in the offensive zone, that's your best defense. Um, but a really good kid, a guy who, you know, he was a captain the last uh, two years in Spokane. And so when you're trading for another team's captain, you're getting, you're usually getting a really good character player, which we have. He's a second round pick by Tampa Bay. And I mean, it, he's a good player. Um, he's going to be a, um, you know, projected third, fourth line center in the NHL. He, he's got a long way to go, but I, I mean, he could be an Adam Lowry type of player, you know, who is going to have to, you know, at the next level, play physical, play hard, win faceoffs, and be really good defensively. Um, he does bring that at our league. Um, because he's real good defensively, he wins faceoffs, and he can be a big physical player. Um, and so it's it's probably something we 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 didn't have in our lineup. Certainly, we didn't have a center that big down the middle, and those those guys are huge for you. Um, the other two guys that we brought in, we brought in uh, Tanner Brown, a defenseman um, who is talk of, he is the epitome of an unsung hero, uh, easy to coach, um, under the radar who competes and battles as hard as anyone who blocks every shot and boxes out and um, just put, makes a simple play. He's all, a lot of time he's off the glass or high flipper, but he can, he can skate in the defensive zone and he battles in the corners. And so we really needed him kind of to round out our top four. Um, and then we brought in uh, Chase Wheatcroft from uh, Lethbridge, another, you know, a guy in his fourth year who's um, just brought us a lot of depth. A guy, he scored a lot, you know, since we brought him in and he He's kind of at times been on our fourth line. And then if, if one of our top two lines is missing a guy, he can move up and easily play with them. So um, I would call, um, you know, all three of them obviously real important, but, you know, it gave us just that much more depth and, uh, and you know, filled some needs that were, uh, were important for us moving forward. 
Well, James, you locked down first place. The rear, the uh, regular season is now in the rear view, and uh, it's all back to square one. Um, tell us about this matchup against PA. Uh, what did you learn from them and from the regular season series, and what are the big challenges for the ice when things drop the puck on uh, Friday night? Um, well, there is interesting because in the last two weeks, there was four teams fighting for the last playoff spot. Uh, them, Calgary, Swift Current, and Regina. Um, the, the best team got in amongst the four, and the best team or the hardest team that we played against. We we were um, five and three against them this year in eight games. Um, they probably um, consistently are um, one of the best defensive teams in the league since Habchide's been there coaching them. Um, they play in that smaller arena in PA, and they um, – uh, every year, I mean, I'm going back to my fifth year in the league, but every year it seems like all their defensemen are six foot four and they got long reaches and long sticks and they box out. Um, probably compared to team PA teams in the past, this team hasn't scored as much, but they compete and they defend well. So it's a, it's going to be a, a really good challenge. It's going to be tough for us to get inside. We're going to have to, we're going to have to battle. We're going to have to not accept being boxed out. We're going to have to pay the price. Um, and get inside and get some second and third chances. Um, that's, you know, to be successful against this team, that's what you have to do. Um, we, I mean, we still have to play our game and we're a fast team. We're a quick transition team. Uh, we do have good speed up front, which I want us to emphasize, but when we do get in the offensive zone, you're going to have to get, eventually you got to get someone in the middle or in the hole or in, in front of, in the blue paint in front of the net. And uh, PA, PA does a good job of uh, keeping you from those areas. James, you guys have had so much success this year. I mean, you've pretty much known for the last month that you're going to be the number one team and, uh, you know, would be playing the eighth seed. Uh, is there any, like, what's the vibe around this week now that the regular season is over as you're, you know, get, getting to playoffs? And from a coaching standpoint, is there anything you need to do um, special to remind these guys that the regular season is over? And uh, this is a long journey that just begins with a strong performance on Friday night. Well, yeah, it's kind of uh, to answer it. Uh, it's twofold. First of all, in the last two weeks of the season, we only played on weekends. We had a super busy schedule for two months, and then it kind of tailed off, which gave us some time to work on some areas that you to fine tune our game, knowing that you know with the playoffs ahead, work on different areas of the game. Five on. Uh, five on six, pulling the goalie or six on five, working on, you know, five on th three special teams. Uh, we, we've spent a lot of time on power play, but you don't spend as much in those areas, work on face off responsibilities. So we've, we've, I felt like we've done that the last two weeks. So this week it's kind of been about just fine tuning our game. Uh, spent a little more time uh, on video today and we will tomorrow just getting, uh, getting PA, uh, you know, totally, uh, I guess, a total focus on on what their strengths are. Um, I think because, um, you know, this, it's been, uh, yeah, you said we've known for a while we've been number one seed, and uh, you could say for most of the year we felt we had a good team and the playoffs were going to be a, a big part of our pitcher. But, you know, all year long we've talked about uh, bigger goals than this, just uh, becoming first or winning the first place in the regular season. Um you know, this is just a stepping stone to where we want to go. Um, so, I mean, we've talked about this all year long, but at the same time, uh, we want to I want to focus on how we have to play. Um, it's about compete and playing the game fast. And then I want our guys having fun. And I want them playing for each other. Um, so, I, you know, again, we don't want to we don't want to change our routine. We don't want to, you know, we want to just keep on going along the way we've been playing the last six weeks. James, before we go, and thanks again for doing this. I know what a busy week it is for you, and we're excited, and people are really enjoying the ice conversation. I have to ask you, as uh, you know, as a guy that played for so long, that could have done a number of things after, you know, after hockey. Um, how fulfilling and how much fun has it been for you to be, you know, here in your hometown, coaching an exciting young team to the success that you've had so far? Um, you know, before you get going for, uh, you know, the ultimate prize, and that would be to win a championship. Um, it is, um, you know, yeah, playing the game a long time is the greatest life in the world. And it was something I was real passionate about and I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, when I, 
and it was maybe at the end of my career, it just became a natural transition. The last five years in Buffalo, I was a mentor type of player. Um, that seemed every year my partner was a 20 year old and I was approaching 40 and uh, played with some, you know, from Jay McKee, Rhett Warner, uh, uh, Brian Campbell, Henrik Tallender, Dimitri Kalinin. Um, always playing with those young guys when I was an older defenseman, um, you know, I would, it just naturally happened that I would be, you know, passing on little things I knew, or we would always be discussing every shift we got off the ice, something else we could have done, or let's try this, our next shift. And it just, um, it evolved into a, a coaching role that started in Buffalo. And I, if you would ask me with five years left in my career, would I have been coaching when I was done playing? I, it wouldn't have been a guess of mine, but I know I was passionate about the game. I love the game. And, um, so started started that way and was lucky to be in that league for 12 years. Um, I feel even more fortunate to do what I'm doing now. Um, I enjoy it more. I, it is a lot more fun uh, being around players this age who are this receptive to um, to advice, to uh, critiquing their games, to you know mentoring and teaching them on and off the ice. Um, it definitely keeps you young. It's 90% of the time it's fun and funny and something that, you know, we're, you're laughing a lot of the time seeing them, uh, seeing them have fun. And it's, yes, I'm, I'm almost 60, but boy, is it fun to see a 17 year old kid with a big smile on his face when he's, when something good happened for him and he deserved it because he worked hard. Well, there's nothing more fun in the, in your line of work than winning. And you guys have done a lot of winning so far. And uh, obviously, I mean, I can just tell you, I mean, so many well wishes to you and the team heading into Friday night for game number one of what we hope will be a long and prosperous playoff run that'll give us lots to talk about for the next couple months here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. James, thanks so much for the time. Good luck to you in the ice. We'll see you out at the ice cave to rally the storm beginning on Friday night for game one against PA. Okay, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. There it is. Head coach James Patrick of the Winnipeg Ice. The playoffs begin on Friday night at the Ice Cave. Go to winnipegice.ca for more information on tickets. You can get a playoff package. It'll get you some seats for next year as well. Uh, but in the meantime, whatever you're doing, if you can clear that sked for Friday or Saturday and get out, this is a team that absolutely deserves the support. They've been doing it all year long. And uh, it's some great hockey. And, man, there's some talented young players. And what a job James has done so far this year with the ice. Really appreciate him joining us uh, today here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. All right, Mike McIntyre is coming up. Well, interesting. I'm going to actually ask Mike about the ice as well before we get into our Jets conversation. Um, but I do want to give a big thank you to Manitoba Battery, a great sponsor of Winnipeg Sports Talk and the go-to place for every kind of battery you could possibly need. Of course, we've been dealing with automotive batteries on this never-ending winter, uh, but right now is the big farm sale for all of our friends out in the rural areas getting ready to get on the fields whenever this damn snow leaves. Um, a number of great deals, and you can check it out at manitobabattery.com, uh, but a few of them include Group 31 1100 cranking amp batteries for just $87.50 and Ford and Chevy half-ton batteries for only $79.50. Now, if you are coming in from outside of the city, your best bet, phone in your order to 783-8787. Uh, Donnie and his great staff will get everything ready for you, so it'll be quick and easy pickup when you pop into the city at 1026 Logan Avenue. And for you city slickers uh, that are getting ready maybe to get out to the cottage, get on the boat, get that golf cart ready for your lot in the summer, uh, extended summer hours right now. So, uh, for instance, when Paul Edmonds has to go pick up a couple things down at Donnie, he can finish his full day of work get in the baseball practice with Nolan and still get there before 8 p.m. 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. Summer extended hours now with our friends over at Manitoba Battery. And of course, you'll save time and money and a heck of a lot more than you would at the big box stores like Costco or Canadian Tire. 1026 Logan Avenue, manitobabattery.com for details. Uh, Royal Sports ready for Blue Jays season and of course, Canada going to the World Cup. The first bits, the uh, We Can 22 Canada shirts are in stock now and more and more Canada soccer gear coming in over the weeks to come as we get ready for that trip to November. But listen, in addition to all the great merchandise, summer, spring first and summer allegedly coming. Uh, and that means 
soccer season, baseball, softball, bikes, fitness, and more. Royal Sports has it all. So whatever you need when it comes to sporting gear or active wear or equipment, Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. And you can find out more on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for their latest merchandise drops and sales as well. And as we're about to talk to the Jets, again, I joked about this yesterday, but uh, we could have Breezy Ben doing our Jets reports right now because tea times are currently being booked. Uh, it might be a little bit of a late start to the season for us here in Manitoba. Uh, but of course, if you're thinking about an incredible home in the future for you and your family with a great junior program, ladies programs, amazing dining facility, and a fantastic course that continues to be improved each and every year, Breezy Bend is the spot. Find out more online at breezybend.ca or uh, give the clubhouse a call. Talk to our pal Corey Johnson, the GM, about the waiting list right now and getting your family in at Winnipeg's premier private club, Breezy Bend Country Club. All right, let's get to it. Mike McIntyre joins us now. Uh, it was fun talking hockey with such a positive and exciting tone, which we just did with James Patrick. What a season the ice have had, huh, Mike? It's going to be real fun watching these young men get after it and uh, you know begin their quest to hopefully uh, bring the city of Winnipeg a Western Hockey League championship. Well, among the folks that'll be down at the ice cave on Friday night will be yours truly, Huss. I'm uh, I'm going to go down and uh, and spin a yarn for Saturday's free press on on game one of the uh, of what you know many people hope and I think expect could be a long playoff run for the ice. Kind of ironic that the Jets are on the cusp of playoff elimination, and yet here in Winnipeg, we may have more playoff hockey than we've ever had. Between the ice and, of course, the Manitoba Moose, who uh, last I checked, I think they're sitting sixth overall in the AHL standings, so they could have a lengthy run this spring as well. And I guess that would be a nice, um, uh, you know, consolation prize, if you will, for the fans of the Jets to actually get, you know, some really fun hockey to watch here, high stakes hockey uh, that lasts more than just a few days, potentially many, many weeks. Uh but yeah, I'm looking forward. I haven't, I have not viewed the ice in person this year. So Friday will be my first viewing and a good time, I guess, to do so. Um, you know, when when the the stage gets bigger. But yeah, James Patrick and crew uh, have done just a tremendous job. And wouldn't it be something if the ice could uh, could march all the way to the Memorial Cup? That would be a real neat story uh, around these parts. Well, for sure. I mean, it'd be great for hockey fans. It'd be great for us. Yeah, something yeah. to talk about with the right. uh, the Jets basically headed for uh, tea times, as we mentioned. Um, you know, we'll talk more about that because I think coaching and, you know, certainly a lot of people very impressed with James Patrick, both as a player, what he's done with the, uh, uh, with the ice. And I can tell you there was more than a couple of uh, comments in the end, uh, the chat. Wouldn't he look interesting behind a Winnipeg jet bench? I mean, I, it's above my pay grade to decide who's ready for that and whether it makes right. sense. Although I will say this, Mike, um, as we look for maybe a change in the culture of Winnipeg, the, the Winnipeg NHL club, I couldn't help but think while I was listening to James talk about how great it would be to have somebody come in with real legitimate roots and connection to this city of Winnipeg as a guy that has grown up. And I mean, that's something that's always sort of been missing with this team. Yeah. Um, listen, I don't think that, you know, local players or local involvement is at the top of that list, but you know, when you are creating a culture of people that, you know, want to be here that are committed to the team, having a Winnipeg guy with that sort of a pedigree um, involved in the operation, whether they're the head coach or elsewhere, right. couldn't, uh, couldn't hurt in my opinion. Well, and there's a guy that I think a lot of folks around here have had an eye on, a, a bit of a local product, a uh, few hours sort of northwest of here, uh, yeah. up in up in Dauphin. And I, I personally don't believe Barry Trotz is going to be out of a job. Uh, you know, the Islanders went to the Eastern Conference final two straight years. They have every excuse in the book. And I think they're, they're kind of finishing strong or, you know, they've been playing some decent hockey. They just dug themselves an incredibly deep hole. I'd be stunned if Barry Trotz were to become available. Uh, but if he were, there's a local product that the Jets should absolutely be making calls on. But yeah, Patrick's an interesting guy. You know, he's been behind an NHL bench, not as a head coach. Uh, in fact, he would have seen a lot of the Winnipeg Jets because he was with the Dallas Stars for a stretch as an assistant coach. And, 
you know, you look at James Patrick, what he was actually credited with doing with that Stars team a few years ago is really fine-tuning some of their young defense prospects. And, you know, I think if you look at the reputation of Dallas over the years, it's been as a really good, solid defensive team. And James Patrick was certainly credited for at least some of that early work. What's the one thing that a lot of folks talk about the Winnipeg Jets and their inability to do very well year after year after year? Well, that's play solid defensive hockey. So I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it is an interesting scenario for sure. And no doubt, if it's not the Jets, um, James Patrick might have other NHL teams falling if uh, if he can lead his ice to a long and successful run. I mean, we've seen that happen time after time where a guy has great success in junior and then catapults into the NHL. Uh, Mike, let's uh, get to the current state of the Jets right now coming out of that miserable weekend in Florida. I I can't say I was surprised with the way things ended, especially with the three days on the beach lead up to those games. I mean, I, you know, it was sort of like we've seen some bad games there before, but with the circumstances and the situation the team is in, um, I don't think many uh, thought that they were going to be giant killers. But you wrote a column on it. We talked about it extensively yesterday. I mean, my takeaway from the weekend wasn't necessarily the performances on the ice because we've seen a number of those so far this year. And those are two very, very elite hockey teams the Winnipeg right. Jets were playing. Um, it was all about what was said after the games. Um, and I know you wrote about this, but, you know, for the show, we'll get your thoughts on, you know, what you heard from Ehlers on Friday and especially Paul Stastny and Kyle Connor on Saturday after the game. Um, I mean, those were some of the most damning comments of of a team, of a culture, of a unit I have, have ever heard, at least when speaking about this team and following it as closely as we have for the last 11 years. Well, absolutely. And, you know, maybe some of it is just born out of frustration. Um, I'll say this, though. If, if folks haven't had a chance to hear Kyle Connor's comments this morning, I would encourage you to check them out because... You know, we got Kyle Connor kind of in the heat of the moment the other day. A few days have passed. So we asked for him again this morning after the morning skate at Madison Square Garden. The Jets did their interviews via Zoom today. And I actually flat out asked Kyle Connor to clarify and expand on his comments from the other night. And I kind of gave him an out, if you will, and that I, I said to him, you weren't implying that some of your teammates have essentially checked out, are you? And his answer was fascinating. Um, uh, You know, he, he, I I won't say he completely doubled down on what he said the other night, but he certainly didn't take the escape hatch and, you know, walk his comments back. And he, he expanded on them, you know, things like culture and, and, uh, you know, playing for each other. And I, I just found it really enlightening. And I think, you know, it's an example, us and the guys you just cited, like we all know Paul Stasny tells it like it is. That's his forte, right? He's a straight shooter. And we appreciate certainly in the media, his candid comments. I think what we've really seen here and, and the last few days are a great example is just the growth and the maturity, not just on the ice, but off the ice of Nikolai Ehlers of Kyle Connor. To me, those two guys have taken huge steps this season in in how they handle media and and pressure. And you know, I'm sure there's some teammates who probably don't like some of what they had to say because there's some hard truths that were spoken by those guys about kind of you know me first mentality and showing up on time and. And, you know, not just going through the motions, but I think the fact that they're sort of saying some of those things out loud um, just speaks to kind of the mess that the Jets have on their hands Mm -hmm. right now and why kind of fixing this is not going to be easy. um, And it's probably going to be a, a complex and very lengthy scenario. And as I wrote in my piece today, like, Uh, I'm not sure exactly who's going to conduct the full-scale investigation of this franchise, but uh, they've got quite the task on their hand, and they'd be wise to kind of follow the trail of evidence and clues that guys like Connor and Ehlers and Stasny just dropped the other day. Well, it's a great point, 
And you know what? While while, you know, while we're here, and I think people probably haven't had a chance to hear this yet, I think yeah. Remus has got this queued up. Let's just Perfect. quickly hear Kyle Connor's uh, response to your question from earlier today, if uh, if that's ready to go there, Reem. Yeah, sorry. One one second. I'm just getting it, getting it. Just I'll, just kind of just just kind of tee it up, um, because as I said, and I'm okay. Here we go. Uh, morning, Kyle. Uh, you said post game the other day. Uh, obviously frustrated about maybe some of the reasons uh, why the team had struggled in those couple games. And one of the comments you mentioned was just maybe motivation being an issue. It was me like about maybe some of the reasons uh, why the team has. You said post game. Hearing myself, sorry about that. Um, and can you just maybe expand it and talk about what you meant by that? Uh, clarify it, if you will. Yeah, I think I caught most of what you were saying there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a situation where, you know, we're not we're not happy with our past couple of games and, um, you know, the performance. Yeah, we're playing some two two pretty good game teams there, and you know, down the stretch here too, we got some good teams. But I think it's we got to look at it as an opportunity to grow as a team. Um, you know, whatever the playoff picture may be, if we're in it or out, um, it's not looking so hot right now, but. Um, it's never too early to start building, you know, that, that chemistry as a team for next year and, you know, that template of what it looks like and, you know, build that good locker room. So I think that's what I was, you know, pointing to for sure. Okay, so it's, it's not so much that there were guys who've already decided that, you know, it's not happening this year and didn't have the motivation. You weren't able to find that. I mean, it's a long season. Um, you know, it's not everybody's going to have their A game every single night, um, but it's what you do when you don't bring it. Um, you know, you still got to contribute to the game, and I think as a group, we got to hold each other accountable for sure. There is, uh, there is Kyle Connor from uh, earlier today, and I mean that last. That last thing is something that I probably said a hundred times over the course of the past two three months talking about this hockey team on this yeah. show. Um, the accountability that was a catchphrase that we talked about what we were hoping to see from this club when the coaching change was made or Paul Maurice left and Dave Lowry came in and it just hasn't seemed to happen, Mike. And um, I mean, we can talk about the players and we certainly will spend a lot of time talking about defensive structure and organization. But I mean, I really think to that and, you know, what he said the other day about building a culture um, and that includes that level of accountability that right. has been missing that, you know, to be honest, it doesn't matter. All the other stuff doesn't matter if you don't first come to work each and every day with that sort of mindset that um, apparently has, it certainly has seemed like it's been missing. And that's sort of confirmed by Kyle Connor today. Yeah. And he, uh, Kyle went on, there was a few other answers as well. And one of them speaks exactly that. I think he said, like, we have all, the talent in the world on this team, but he basically said it doesn't mean anything if we don't use it properly. So, you know, there's a, there's an awareness there for sure that um, you hope maybe rubs off on, on some of his teammates. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, Huss. I got some pushback on social media from folks criticizing Kyle Connor's criticism, actually pointing the finger of blame at Kyle Connor sort of as one of the primary culprits on the Jets this year, pointing to, you know, the that same old story, the drum that gets beaten and that his defensive play, you know, leaves you wanting in some areas. And, um, you know, sure, there's some nights and some plays I'm sure Kyle Connor would like back, but my goodness, if we're now, if we're now firing the darts at uh, a guy who's put up 85 points and, you know, 43 goals, like, um, yeah, I think then this team has more problems than we even imagined if if we're going to lump, you know, him in. And, of course, you know, it goes in cycles. People point the finger of blame at Connor Hellebuck, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Connor Hellebuck's been left to his own devices. Paul Stasi himself said it the other day. We've left him out, hung him out to dry far too often. So the blame game is kind of in, in full, full effect right now. And, uh, you know, where this all kind of, sorts out in in the summer in the off season and as i say like who's leading the the probe here whether it's kevin shovel day off who gets you know a 12th year he's done he's 
11 years now into this. Um, I, I'd be a little surprised if Kevin Shoveldayev does not get another year to kind of get this right. Um, but, you know, and this is something you and I have talked about before. Again, I, I listed a bunch of examples today in my column on organizations that have brought in sort of an outside voice. Um, you know, uh, Jimmy Rutherford, the latest example, kind of in Vancouver. And there's a number of teams. John Davidson is that guy in Columbus, right? Brendan Shanahan's that guy in Toronto. Um, Bob Nicholson's that guy in, in Edmonton. Like that extra level of oversight, that buffer kind of between ownership and GM, that's not something the Jets have or have ever had. And I do wonder, given, I guess, the magnitude of the issues that might exist here, um, and, you know, tunnel vision is a very real thing, right? We hear it in, in police work, the, the, the risks of tunnel vision. Well, I would suggest there's a risk of tunnel vision when you're running a sports franchise as well. The idea that you know better than anybody. But you know what? Sometimes familiarity does breed contempt and, and you get those blind spots. And I just wonder if the Jets, if they're not going to do a full scale house cleaning and, you know, from the GM and you know, I expect we're going to see a different coaching staff. Uh, but if, if, if we're not talking full-scale changes, then the idea of kind of another voice uh, to come in and kind of look top to bottom, as Kyle Connor said the other day, top to bottom kind of needs to get a full review here. Um, you know, I, I think there'd be some real benefit to the Jets for that. Well, and it's certainly something that I think many people have talked about. And, um, you know, we'll, well, I guess we'll find out in the next little while as to how... Right this organization, um, you know, handles things because Mike, what, what, it, what will be fascinating? I mean, listen, I think there's going to be plenty of things that'll be of great interest to Winnipeg jet fans about potential changes and how things go. But I mean, I don't think there's anything that'll be more interesting that <clears throat> that final day, uh, the garbage bag day, if you will, where we hear from the Winnipeg jets and right. I mean, listen, we basically heard from the same guys quite a bit for the better part of the last four, five, six games at minimum. Yep. Josh Morrissey, Nikolai Ehlers, Paul Stastny, Kyle Connor. And Kyle I think Lowry. there's a there's a re, there's a reason for that. And you know, and again, I sort of explained this yesterday. I mean, for people wondering where Blake Wheeler is, I mean, I, I, he's not being asked for. I don't think right now. And I don't know whether there's just a, a, an agreement between the captain and the media that it's not productive on either side for them to get together. But man, I have to admit, because I'll say this about Blake, <clears throat> um, you know, we can talk about the, uh, like, to me, there's two conversations, the leadership group, how things have been run, the structure of the team, all of that is one thing, which certainly he's a big part of. And then there's the on ice part of it. And right. I'll never doubt what Wheeler brings to the game each and every night. And to be honest, I think, especially in this last sort of stretch, since he and Mark Shipley have been, and been split up. He's been playing, you know, he's been playing his ass off as he always does. And he does right. lead by example. But man, I, I couldn't help Saturday, today, listening to these comments and wonder, you know, where Blake Wheeler's at right now. Because we know that he has, um, I mean, listen, he, he cares. I mean, we know that. And I think he takes so much of this personally. Yeah. Um, and that's been clear in, you know, in some of the times where nothing was personal to begin with. I mean, sometimes it's sort of, you know, I think, you know, fabricated within himself. But I mean, what do you think the captain is right now with, with what's happened right now with this club, with hearing some of these truths being spoken by his teammates? I mean, we haven't heard it from him, but I imagine this is, you know, he talked about this being the hardest season of the year, yeah. you know, a few months ago. Well, I don't think it's gotten any easier for the captain up until this point. Yeah, and you know you've hit the nail on the head in in that we haven't heard from him a lot, and there's there's I think a couple of reasons for that. Uh, I can tell you he's been asked for a couple times fairly recently where he's been receiving we're told medical treatment after games, um, and this speaks to your point about the on ice stuff and how much he cares. I fully believe Blake Wheeler is playing hurt right now. I mean we know he had an injury, he missed a couple games. And then he came back, um, and I think he probably came back with the idea that he's the captain and the team still has a fighting chance, and so he's going to play. Um, I'll be curious to see Huss, like, you know, Jets, I don't believe they can physically be eliminated now tonight with Dallas. Dallas, I think, needed to get a point last night. 
even if the Jets lose tonight, um, I think Nashville can kind of eliminate Winnipeg from catching them, but <clears throat> Dallas isn't playing. So I think the earliest the Jets could be eliminated would be tomorrow if they were to lose tonight and Dallas picks up at least a point because um, there's tiebreaker scenario and, and whatnot that, that the Jets would potentially have. That being said, I am curious if if the Jets are, you know, once they are eliminated, it, does Blake Wheeler get shut down? Um, and I think that'll be interesting because I do suspect he's not at 100% right now, that he's battling through something. I think So I think that's part of why we haven't heard from him very much. But there's also the element that you touched on, which is that when he has sort of spoken this season, especially recently, I don't know that there's a whole lot coming out of it. Uh, and part of that is, you know, Blake Wheeler's not – very happy right now. And I don't know how productive some of these media sessions are where, you know, you're, you're just getting that hostility and not a whole lot of insight into maybe what's going on. And, you know, contrast that with that. There are some players who seem to have stepped up to embrace that role of, of, you know, being very candid at times about what's going on. And I think they become the go-tos for us in the media uh, where you need some sound bites, you want to help tell the story, so you go to the guys that you know you can kind of count on to do that. Now, there's a whole other discussion, I suppose, to be had is, do we have a problem when the captain of the team, you know, the kind of face of the organization is not very accommodating at times in providing some of that insight, and then that's who Blake Wheeler is, right? So, you know, I think a lot to kind of discuss and digest for sure. But uh, I do believe the captain is mm-hmm. still playing hurt. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess we'll see here for the final after tonight. You know, there's five games left. Does Blake Wheeler play all five of those games? Um, if they essentially don't mean anything, at least in terms of the standings, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll remains to be seen. Well, Mike, let's get to tonight's game um, because, um, you know, you were uh, there on the call and it seems like I uh, <laughs> I joked earlier that, uh, you know, Maurice's old saying was that you don't break up a winning lineup. <laughs> um, I haven't been doing much winning lately, but that lineup stays the same. Um, what do you make of uh, what Dave Lowry's rolling out tonight uh, as the Jets head into MSG? Woof. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, I mean, I, I did Dylan Sandberg struggle a little bit the, on Friday night in Florida. Sure. Did everybody on the Jets in a six-one loss struggle? Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure singling out Dylan Sandberg and plucking him out of the lineup and essentially leaving everyone else untouched was really the way to go. And then. You know, it'd be another story if the guy that you put in 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 Dylan Sandberg's place, Logan Stanley, like had a lights out performance the next night. Um, again, most of the Jets really struggled, especially in the second half of that game against the Lightning. And you know, I can think of a couple plays that Logan Stanley made that left you kind of scratching your head, like where you're going, where's he going, what's he doing out, you know, on that particular play. So, I'm. I, you know, the, the idea here to me should be trying to prop up some of these young guys, obviously seeing what they can do in different situations. And uh, I, I must admit, I'm a little surprised that Sandberg will remain out of the lineup tonight. Um, You know, I don't imagine Dave Lowry had it in him to scratch Dylan DeMello, for example, who's also struggled a lot. I mean, heck, every defenseman not named Josh Morrissey has really struggled, not just lately, but you could argue for most of the season. But I don't think Dave Lowry is going to healthy scratch one of his veterans. So we're kind of down to, well, it's either Logan Stanley or (laughs) Dylan Sandberg. And we know the Jets have a lot invested in Logan Stanley, right? First round pick. They protected him in the expansion draft. And so they're going to try and do what they can, obviously, to to get his game to a spot they like. But unfortunately, right now, anyways, it seems to be coming at the expense of Dylan Sandberg the same way earlier in the year it came at the expense of Billy Hainala. Uh, and it's kind of the same old, same old story, unfortunately. As for the forwards, um, look, Adam Brooks, uh, I, I don't 
see Adam Brooks as a guy that's really in the long-term plans for this franchise. So to me, it's neither here nor there. Uh, I mean, I'm glad Morgan Barron's going to get another look and he deserves it. He'll be on a slightly different line tonight with Appleton and, and Lowry. I mean, Zach Sanford's playing in the top six. He's a UFA that they went and acquired at the trade deadline. Could they could they be using that spot for a young guy on the moose right now? Yes. Um, but it is what it is. And, uh, you know, the, this is the these are the cards that Dave Lowry's decided he wants to play. Uh, the one thing I'll say about Barron playing on the, I mean, the one positive, and listen, I've really liked seeing him get an opportunity in the top yeah. six, and in particular that Montreal game. I thought he really made the most of that opportunity, probably more so than we've seen Sanford make of in the right. uh, longer body of work. But I'll say this about Morgan Barron. You know, the package that he bring, brings in, with the combination of his skating, the size, how good he's been on the boards and winning puck battles. Yeah. To me, if you were going to look at a realistic spot where he fits into this lineup next year, um, you know, potentially along with Adam Lowry and Mason right. Appleton is a spot that could make a lot of sense. So uh, I'll be honest, I kind of thought that that's where he would have been against Montreal. Really like what we saw from him yeah. playing with Stastny and Ehlers. But as far as that goes, I have no issue at all with, with Morgan Barron in that spot. And I think it actually makes a lot of sense, um, you know, in these final six games to see how he might fit in in a role with two guys that I think uh, there's probably a lot of things that are unsure about next year, but I would be pretty sure that, you know, some combination of Appleton Lowry and player X on that third line is going to be in. And uh, this would be a great audition for him. Absolutely. And, you know, fitting that it comes tonight against the New York Rangers and the guy that was in that spot for so long, AKA Andrew Kopp, I'm sure at some point during the game tonight, Andrew Cott might skate skate over to uh, Morgan Barron and say, uh, hey, uh, you know, uh, enjoy your time on that line, kid. Uh, I used to be in your shoes or your skates kind of thing. Uh, of course, Andrew Cott's now gone on to slightly bigger and better things. He's playing with the bread man and he's a point of game player and the Rangers are winning a lot of hockey games. And heck, I'm sure there's a lot of Jets fans that have become Rangers fans, Huss, because if they can get out of the first two rounds of the playoffs, well, one of those second rounders becomes a first rounder. And, uh, you know, if that means the Jets can get a, another, you know, better prospect on top of Barron and an, another second round pick, uh, I think that will ease some of the the pain of losing Andrew Kopp. But yeah, it should be interesting to see what Morgan Barron can do. That's a, that's a big heavy line now with, with Adam Lowry and Morgan Barron playing together, uh, there may be some, uh, you know, black and blue opponents as a result. No doubt about it. Hey, can you clarify something? Because there have been some folks in the chat wondering about Sanford and uh, Sandberg and saying maybe this is related to games played uh, because he's got 10 games and they wouldn't want his contract to, to go over. I, I think at his age, and the fact of the matter, he's already played his 10th game, right? So, right. I mean, that, that, that has nothing to do with it. I mean, if that was the case and they were going to send him down, even if that applied, I don't imagine he'd be with the club. He'd probably be with the Manitoba Moose. No, so there's a couple of reasons. That, first of all, you're right. I believe the cutoff, it's nine games. Is kind of, once you play that Yeah, 10, once you play the 10th game. So he's past that. But I also believe, I mean, don't forget, this is not a this is not a guy that went through the Canadian Hockey League mm -hmm. as an 18, 19-year-old and then came up. He, he took the longer road. Uh, and so he's an older young player. And so I, I don't believe, I mean, I don't know the CBA in the exact terms in front of me, but I don't believe that that, sort of save a year off his ELC would even be an issue because of his age, even if he was at nine games or less. So no, I mean, and that being said, I'll be stunned if Dylan Sandberg doesn't get in at least some of these final five after tonight. Like if, if, if that, I can't see them just saying, well, we've seen enough at the NHL level this year. Um, and they'll re, you know, he's going to go back to the moose for the playoffs. No question about it. But they got to get him in a few more NHL games here down the stretch, I would think, because this is a guy that should be a big part of their plans for next season. Well, and, and let's face it, even if they even if they make the decision that, hey, we're going to run, I wouldn't necessarily agree with it, but hey, these are the guys we're going to run with the rest. It makes no sense to have him here. I mean, you're, no. you're going to take two and a half, three weeks off for a player right. and then expect him to go in and play 20 plus minutes a night in playoff action again, the Calder Cup. I mean, that that can't possibly be what they're thinking. So I'm sort of with you as well um, on that. Mike, to finish up before we have to go, 
Um, what? There's six games left, including tonight, four games at home. Be very interesting to see how the roster looks. But, um, you know, considering where we are at right now, considering there haven't been any changes going into tonight, how much change do you think we'll see? I mean, is this just waiting for the official word, the, the final shovel of dirt on the on the coffin of the season, and then everything will change? I do think... Uh, as much as they can, I mean, they still have these, they're, they're limited to just four call-ups. I'm, again, I'm not sure if they've used one or two because the emergency call-up is not the same as as a regular call-up. But, you know, so they will have a little flexibility to pull some guys up to maybe get a few games in. Um, and I do expect that they will be doing that. Um, you know, Connor Hellebuck's not going to play the last five after tonight. At least he better not. Are you uh, sure? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it, it may be, here's the thing. This is where you may hear, as soon as it's official, you may see some guys, you know, sat out a game or two, like veteran guys. And even if it's, even if it's not completely true, they'll phrase it as, well, he's been battling something, you know, so we're going to give him. Yeah, a like 2016. Days. That was the whole, I mean, they shut For down sure. about half a dozen players immediately There's at that point. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of nagging injuries that suddenly come to light in uh, in the next 24, 48, 72, whatever it is, hours uh, that will give. And, and that's where they could potentially even get around the call-ups because if they can, I, I don't know what level of proof you need to show the NHL that guys are banged up. I mean, everybody's banged up this time of year. So you could probably make the case that every call-up is going to be a, quote, emergency call-up if you can argue that some of your guys are battling injuries. So, yeah, I mean, to me, that would be the perfect scenario. Get a bunch of guys out from the moose, you know, either guys that we've seen a little bit of, you know, whether it's Declan Chisholm or Kovacevic. Uh, heck, give Leon Gavonki a game. He's leading the moose in in scoring on the blue line. Give Mikel Burden a game with the idea that these guys are then going back to the moose, and the hope is that they're going to parlay that into a long playoff run this spring and everybody benefits long term from that situation so yeah I mean it, it's probably not going to happen by Thursday because with them being on the road um, you know just to, to to shuttle guys in and out but I would expect starting Sunday and for those last four games next week that we could see a bit of the uh, the Winnipeg Moose or the Manitoba Jets in action at Canada Life Centre. Mike, looking forward to it. We'll see what happens tonight in the game. And, of course, uh, chop it up tomorrow. And look forward to having you next week, as well as right after um, Garbage Bag Day <laughs> coming up in two weeks. That will be interesting. Thanks for your time, pal. You bet. Enjoy. Take care. All right. Great stuff. Uh, Six o'clock puck drop tonight at MSG. Uh, we'll have more when we get Remo back in here. But we are going to talk Blue Jays coming up in just a second. Uh, before we do that, a uh, quick shout out to our friends at Canadian Club. Great sponsors of Winnipeg Sports Talk. We told you the CC and Ginger is here now. And you could have always made it. Now, though, they've done it for you. The ready-to-drink Canadian Club and Ginger cocktail available at your local Manitoba liquor stores. Pick it up in six packs. If you're in the liquor marts and you see the Canadian Club display, buy Canadian Club product, you get a free can to try out for the new drink of the summer. And again, all month long as well, Canadian Club 1750 mLs on sale at your local Manitoba liquor marts. We'll have another CC marble race coming for you to finish up the show on Friday. Lots of talk about vehicles right now and people considering moving to an electric vehicle. No better place to find out more on that than our friends over at Not Auto Corp with their new Tesla experience. How will the electric vehicles be different? What are the benefits from it? How does it work charging? How does the car feel to drive? Not Auto Corp has the program for you if you're thinking about moving to electric. And regardless of whether you're thinking an electric vehicle or a traditional vehicle, why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Not team down at Waverly and McGilvery. Find out more on the Tesla experience and more at Not. Dot ca and a big cheers to our friends at little brown jug brewing winnipeg's favorite local beer uh it, it's a matter of time before patios are open 
that time might be multiple weeks because of this damn snow that keeps happening. That being said, whether you're in a bar or restaurant, try the 19, pop by your local beer or liquor store and pick up the great taste of Little Brown Jug and visit them at the brewery and tap room down in the exchange on William Avenue. You can try all the beers there. You can pick it up as well. And if you can't make it down or you're staying home these days, Order online, citywide delivery from Little Brown Jug, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays at littlebrownjug.ca. All right, we've talked enough hockey for a while. Let's get ready for the Jays and Red Sox. And welcome back an old friend, longtime Blue Jays writer and podcaster, Andrew Stoughton to the program. Andrew, what's going on, man? It's great to talk to you again. Yeah, it's great to talk to you too, man. Uh, not much going on, just waiting for the Jays and Red Sox. You got it. Yeah, off day yesterday. I had to figure out what we were going to do, but uh, the boys are back right now. First things first, <laughs> 10 games in. Now, what have you thought about uh, you know the first 10-game segment of the season for the Blue Jays? I thought it's been really good. It's been really encouraging because they're not really clicking just yet, I wouldn't say, right? Like, uh, you know, the, the offense has had some problems in the games where, you know, Guerrero's had to carry them. Uh, the starting pitching has been a bit spotty, obviously, at times. You know, Ryu is now on the injured list. We'll see what Yusei Kikuchi does tonight. Uh, but he hasn't uh, – he's, he's looked like the project that I think everybody thought he was going to be. Like, he's a Pete Walker special kind of a thing. Um, the bullpen's been good, but, like, but in general, it just hasn't felt like they've really, like, started clicking, especially offensively. And I think once this team really starts to hit and things warm up a bit, uh, they're going to be a menace. Like they're they're going to be a real tough team, but it's a tough stretch that they're on right now. And they're and and it, it's you know uh, you know they're playing Boston, Houston, and New York for the next sixteen games, I believe. Um, so that is going to be uh, a, a bit of an early season test, but I think you know already so far they're showing all sorts of encouraging signs. Well, you mentioned being a menace. I mean, I don't know if there is a bigger menace to opposing pitching right now than Vlad Guerrero. Although we have seen the good and the bad Vlad in back-to-back -back games, he goes from a hat trick of homers to the golden sombrero. Uh, <laughs> that being said, though, he looks like he's in great shape. He's certainly having a lot of fun being one of the leaders of this exciting young team, and. Uh, I mean that performance he put on last week in the in the Bronx was uh, was a legendary game, and if that is at all the sign of what's to come for the Blue Jays, it's both great for the team, but also from fans, just with the exciting nature of this club, and certainly a guy that we'll be probably talking about in MVP consideration for the majority of the season. Yeah, I would absolutely think so. I mean, we might have to have the same conversation we did last year with Otani, but. Uh... But that's all right, you know. Uh, being second to that guy is, uh, is there, there's no shame in that. Uh, you're right that the swing and miss has been a little bit more prominent so far this year for Vlad, but you know it's still really early, uh, and he clearly, like you say, he's in great shape. And uh, I think was very fortunate to to not have a broken hand on that play in, in the Bronx for the night he hit the three home runs. Um, but but that was just a testament to you know what what he can do, and I think that was just part of what was so legendary about that par uh, performance, and it's definitely one we're going to reflect on at the end of the year, I think. Um, but he might have more games like that in him still, right? He's just, he's that kind of guy and he really controls the strike zone and the at-bats and, you know, maybe some of the swing and misses related to, uh, some not great calls that I know a lot of Jays fans were talking about, uh, over the weekend. Uh, but yeah, he, he's exciting and, and you could tell he has fun and, and that guys want to be around him and, and that he's really, uh, you know, even at 23 is becoming uh, a true leader on this <laughs> team and, and, you know. That's a that's that's a guy that a lot of guys clearly want to go into battle with, and you know to use the tired <laughs> war metaphor there. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's a great place for the franchise to be to have a guy like that, obviously as their centerpiece. Andrew, we'll move on to the pitching in a minute. Um, but as far as the you know the the one to nine, the lineup, uh, you know, offensively and in the field. I mean, uh, you know, you knew there were some big pieces that left in the off season, uh, you know, no one bigger than Simeon in the season that he had last year. Are there any, and, and we've talked about like, we know Vlad's going to be there. We know Bo's going to be there. We know the mainstays. Is there any areas of concern right now? Um, I would imagine behind the plate might be one of them with Danny Jansen concern, but uh, uh, out for a little bit. I mean, just when you look at it, where are the areas that you think they might need either some help or just need a little bit more production out of? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously, with injuries to Teoscar and to Danny Jansen, the, the depth is being tested, and that's probably you know the place where before you know the season started, you look at, the, at them on paper and you thought that that would probably be uh, the thing that tested them, their depth. Uh, and we're seeing it a bit right now. And they've added Remel Tapia, they've added uh, uh, Brad Zimmer, uh, which helps a little bit, though that's more sort of defensive uh, depth than offensive, uh, uh, especially at Zimmer. Um, Zach Collins has looked all right, uh, just after looking terrible in the first uh, few at bats that Blue Jays fans saw of him, and that's maybe encouraging. But you know, I don't think he's going to hit as well as he did all weekend. But that's that's 
If you can get some usage out of a guy like that right now, that will definitely help uh, ease the burden of not having Danny Jansen. And I think down the line, Gabriel Moreno is their top prospect, and we might see him, though I think the Jays are probably doing all that they can to avoid bringing him up uh, too quickly. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's maybe an area of concern because the catching situation is sort of uh, there's a lot there's a lot of uh, uh, square pegs that are, need to be fit into a round hole there, uh, and maybe some infield depth with it could be useful as well. Though Santiago Espinal has looked uh, has looked like a starter so far and has kind of taken the reins there. Now, uh, as far as the pitching goes, it it was a very ominous debut for Barrios in uh, the first game, and we were talking about the the matchup for his second start and looked at a one oh eight ERA, which uh, you don't usually see anyone touching triple digits. Did bounce back. Uh, I, I'm very high on him. I mean, I think, and certainly the Jays are as well with the extension that they gave him. Uh, but starting with Barrios, who have you liked, and who have you maybe left you wanting a bit more as far as the rotation goes? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think he bounced back really well, Barrios, in that start, and he's obviously, uh, like you said, the Jays paid him a lot of money for a reason. He's been as, as durable and as as consistent as any starter in the game the last several years. So, uh, yeah, I don't think there's any reason to be worried there. I think Kevin Gossman has looked great, uh, and that's really encouraging because you know he's another guy they paid a lot of money to, and he's kind of the straight replacement for Robbie Ray, which is, you know, the, that's a lot to live up to. Obviously, the guy who won the Cy Young, but. Uh, uh, you know, he's looked the part so far. And I think people were a little bit concerned, like co- looking at his second half last year, it wasn't quite as, as well, it wasn't nearly as good as his first. Uh, and he'd been okay or pretty good in in, uh, in in 2020 and, you know, had not just never really sort of put the pieces together. Uh, and so to see him already starting the year to like looking like the guy that, uh, that earned that $100 million, $110 million contract, whatever it was, uh, I think that's been, I think that's been excellent. Manoa has been, ridiculous and I uh, just can't wait to see where that goes because he is so young and he's still adding dimensions to his arsenal and uh, and and it's just you know a guy who you know, the, the bulldog mentality you hear those well-worn saws about uh, stuff like that but you know he does want to he's aggressive he goes out there he's going to hit guys uh, you know not on purpose but uh, that's just he he is playing at the margins there uh, and and is a fiery kind of competitive guy and uh, you know a, a someone who I think Jays fans are going to like for a really long time uh, and it's just it's obviously been Ryu was uh, was was a difficult one uh, he's on the aisle now you know he can't he can't operate at 88 miles an hour. I mean, in the big leagues, especially if he doesn't have his location, which was the case in his final start before uh, an MRI and a, and a trip to the IL. So that that is something we'll have to watch. Uh, and Kikuchi, I think, you know, will just be a project and will be tinkered with the whole year. So uh, uh, it's, it's been all right. And Ross Stripling has looked fine in replacement, you know, in replacing Ryu and having, you know, a couple uh, outings already. So they can probably weather that storm. But uh, but getting Ryu back to the of 2020 would be uh, or even the first half of 2021 would be an excellent thing for this team long term what about the if we take the temperature of the bullpen right now 10 games in uh, how are we feeling about the uh, depth of the bullpen as uh, well as you know Romero in the closing position and do you think that there might be changes going forward or pretty good start overall I think a pretty good start overall yeah I think Adam Simbers looked great Romano's obviously looked great he's just he's been had they've had to use him too many times because the 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 offense really hasn't know had those blowout wins yet and i think that's something that they're really going to need to give the bullpen some some just extra days off because romano has been used a, a lot we've seen a lot of simber we've seen a lot of uh, jimmy garcia uh but i think as a group they've looked pretty good so far and you know when you have a guy like like david phelps who's like your fourth fifth guy Trevor richards has looked good julian merriweather is, is kind of a wild card you know some days he's 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 like lights out and some days uh looks a bit hittable and the ball ends up flying over the wall but uh but on the whole, yeah, I think the, the group looks pretty good. I mean, health will determine their fate, I think, obviously. And that's, you know, that was the problem last year uh, was that the, the health was just not there for the bullpen were basically right from the start. And that, I think, was was probably the most crucial thing to to why they ended up missing the playoffs. So uh, fingers crossed if you're a Jays fan uh, that the health stays where it is because uh, as a group, when they are healthy as they are right now, um, they look excellent. They're not, you know, they're not blowing everybody away. They're not, you know, uh, wouldn't put them in the top five bullpens in baseball, but they're just a really, really solid unit that I think is going to serve the team well because every other element of the team is uh, uh, is, is elite, basically. Andrew Stoughton's our guest on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily, talking Jays 10 games into the season. It'll be Kikuchi on the hill tonight as they start a series in Boston against the Red Sox. And make sure to follow Andrew on Twitter at Andrew Stoughton and check out the Substack. A couple of quick questions. You mentioned health. This isn't necessarily the health of the players on the field, but a larger health issue. 
the COVID vaccine and, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> of course, the international <laughs> rules. Um, how big of a deal is it right now from what you're hearing about other teams, especially in the AL East, for members of their club that are still doing their own research and uh, <laughs> and waiting. How big of a deal is this going to be for games at the Rogers Center this year from what you're hearing? I, I mean, as, lo as long as the rule doesn't change, yeah, I think we're going to hear about it a lot. I mean, because there are there are some very prominent guys who, uh, you know, Chris Sale admitted uh, that he wasn't vaccinated. I don't want to like, I don't want to guess, uh, you know, people will whisper about various Yankees and, and I guess we'll see when it's their turn to come to, to Canada and see who gets put on the restricted list. Um, but it's it's such an it's such a disadvantage for the Jays that it's a it's a shame that it's getting framed. Uh, otherwise, uh, every time it's mentioned in the United States, and it's becoming an issue, and it will become an even bigger issue when the Red Sox and the Yankees have to visit Toronto, uh, because that will sort of hit fans in the face with oh like oh what we can't have these guys play. You know you've seen crazy talk like oh the Jays should play at a neutral site, and it's like uh, it's it, it's just it's absurd. The Jays have to have all their players vaccinated to cross into the you know to fly into the states. The rules are basically the same on both sides of the border, uh, and the Jays have had to tailor their offseason to you know dealing with uh, guys who weren't vaccinated. We saw Kirby Snead was traded in the Matt Chapman deal to the A's, and he was on the restricted list. So you could kind of see why the Jays had to you know had their hand forced and probably had to make a you know, make a include a guy in a deal who maybe they didn't necessarily want to because he was just going to miss fifty percent of the games this year. So it's a it's a real competitive disadvantage. They're getting tested a lot more, which is potentially going to you know, flag more guys and end up with guys on the, uh, you know, on the COVID IL, uh, which could put them at a disadvantage as well. So I, I think it's important. And Mike Wilner wrote a great piece about this uh, for the Toronto Star uh, that was just went up last night. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, it's important to frame it that way. And I think Canadians are having a much easier time and Jays fans are having a much easier time framing it that way than, you know, the fans of the Red Sox and the American media who kind of uh, are like, whoa, like Chris Sale's not going to be able to pitch in Toronto all year. Aaron Judge might not be able to play against the Jays. Like that's that's like nine or ten games. It's, uh, that's, that's big for the Yankees. And it's like, yeah, well, there's a real easy way for him to have been able to be <laughs> play. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, no different for uh, the guys coming from Canada to the other yeah. side of the border. It is yeah. interesting at this point, two years in, that this is still um, <laughs> the topic that it is. But uh, I don't think it's going any way soon. And of course, the no. Sox are dealing with, uh, I believe they're down to their top two catchers for the game tonight because of an outbreak within the club. Andrew, last one for you. And this is sort of a, a, a fun question when it comes to just what an exciting season this could be, especially in the AL East. I saw, and again, you know, we see all these sort of projections and whatnot going into the year. There was one I saw which had a four-way tie for first place <laughs> in the AL East. I believe it was like 88 wins or 90 wins or something like that with the Jays, Red Sox, Yankees, and, uh, and Rays. I'm looking at the standings right now. The Jays are in first place at six and four. You got the Yankees and Red Sox at five and five. The Rays at five and six. Do you think that this is going to be a very tight four horse race pretty much for the entire 162 i think it really could be yeah absolutely i mean like the jays are, are you know they've inched out and it's you know what a tiny percentage of the season we've had so far but like i say they've got they're they got a, a real set of obstacles in front of them with you know going to boston going to houston coming back playing the red Sox and astros at home and then the yankees as well you know those divisional games are going to be so so important um and it, it's going to be really fun i mean it's uh it, it's not often that that this situation is is here right like when the jays were really good in 2015 2016 the yankees and red sox were kind of uh, you know on the downside a little bit uh and and the, right now all four teams are really on equal footing and really on paper look look uh capable each of of winning this division um you know i i perhaps have my biases and then i think a lot of the projections sort of have the jays perhaps a little bit ahead of everybody else and, and i think that makes some sense but health is going to mean a ton and what happens in these divisional games is going to mean a ton hey just before we go i was just thinking about this it, so like if judge say judge you know unvaxxed can't play in canada and he's going to miss uh you know nine games this season Do you know if he gets paid for those games he does not he does not Oh, geez, that, the research <laughs> might be sped up a little bit uh, we're just in time for those series in Toronto. Andrew, great stuff. Fill people in on where they can find your content and uh, fill us on what you got going on. Now the Jays season is uh, fired up and everyone uh, can't wait for these games night after night. Yeah, just trying to trying to pump out you know weekday recaps of all the games at uh, thebatflip.ca. You can always find me cranking out tweets on, uh, on Twitter at, at Andrew Stoughton. That's S-T-O-E-T-E-N. Um, and that's that. If you hit those two places, that's pretty much where you'll find me. And uh, it should be a really, really exciting season. And, and 
Uh, looking forward to it. Looking forward to tonight and this this you know twenty games in twenty days that they're about to do. Going to be a lot of fun. There it is. Independent coverage of Blue Jays baseball from Andrew the Batflip.ca, and make sure you give him a follow on Twitter. Let's do this again again soon, pal. Thanks so much for the time. We always appreciate you. Yeah, anytime, man. Thanks so much. <laughs> Good stuff. Blue Jays talk with Andrew Stroten on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Looking forward to this game tonight. The opener between the Jays and the Boston Red Sox. Thanks again to Andrew for jumping by. All right, we got to get to uh, some cool bet lines. We will discuss and we'll see what the uh, line is like for that uh, game coming up. Uh, but again, um, a huge thank you to Princess Auto for their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. We can't wait to start talking gold eyes and start talking bombers on some of our Princess Auto reports. Of course, we've done the curling reports all season long. One more event this year for the top teams before most of them go their separate ways and uh, be part of new teams going forward. I personally am really looking forward to Reed Carruthers and Jason Gunlickson coming together next season. Of course, Reed moving on from the Mike McIntyre, or Mike McEwen team not Mike McIntyre team. Of course, Mike was just with us a little earlier. And Gunlickson teaming up with this old pal, Reed. We'll get both of those guys on the show very soon. Um, and we will fill you in on that final event coming up next month. In the meantime, Princess Auto continues to be the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything. You need to complete the projects on your list or start something new. Is it Princess Auto? Visit them at either of their two Winnipeg locations, or you can shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Um, we saw James Patrick join us earlier today, and if you did join us late, great conversation getting ready for ice playoffs with James Patrick. Of course, he was sitting in front of the big BP banner, as Boston Pete's is a big sponsor of the Winnipeg Ice. And... Certainly, if you're heading down to the Ice Cave, that BP on Pemina Highway, a great spot before and after games. We still will be having four Winnipeg Jet games and hopefully plenty of Moose regular season and playoff games coming up. Boston Pizza, great spot at City Place before and after events at City Place. And if you're at home watching the game, check out their great game day deals and order online at bostonpizza.com. Uh, and of course, Nick and Nikki are ready for spring and ready for summer. The blizzard machines are rolling right now. Unfortunately, Mother Nature's blizzard machine has been going as well. Uh, but it's just about that time. If you haven't been by your local Nick and Nicky DQ, why don't you do that stat? DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. And uh, listen, I think we're always in the mood for ice cream. But if you're in a mood for a burger, the amazing new stack burgers are available if you haven't tried them, what are you waiting for? You can pick it up at any of those four Nick and Nicky DQs. And for folks in Winnipeg, all three Winnipeg locations now available for delivery on all the local delivery apps. Hit them up online or on Instagram, excuse me, at DQ Manitoba. If you want to get Nick and Nicky working on a custom cake for your next event to be picked up quick and easy at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. All right, let's get Michael Remus back in here. Been a great show. We've hit a lot of topics so far today, Reem. I mean, I, I, listen, I can talk Blue Jays anytime right now. Exciting start to the season. And the Jets will always be a big topic, as will the Bombers on this club. Uh, but I've got to tell you, I really, really enjoyed, as I always do, a visit with James Patrick. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of excitement around this ice playoff run beginning on Friday night when uh, the ice hosts PA for game one of their uh, first round series. I would think so. Um, people are disappointed there's no playoff hockey with the Jets, but if you want your playoff hockey fix for a local flavor, you know, why not uh, latch on to the ice? You know, If you haven't been following this year, one of the top teams in junior hockey and playing games Friday, Saturday, game one and two against Prince Albert, I'm, I'm going to be following it for sure, and the Moose as well. So, you know, again, while we don't have Jets, like we can still follow some other playoff hockey as we get into the spring. So I'm so I'm told we'll be getting into the spring. Yeah, well, exactly. And I'll tell you what else we're going to be hitting, and I'm looking forward to doing it, is Valor FC. Uh, I mean, there's been all the excitement, and we've talked probably more soccer, at least men's soccer. I mean, I've always been a big, uh, I've always been in on our women's teams, and they've been winning and giving us reasons to talk about them for the better part of the last dozen or dozen years as I've been doing this. But we've talked more men's soccer in the past year than we ever have before. And, of course, Alfonso Davies and Team Canada qualifying for the World Cup has been the big catalyst in that. 
Um, but the CPL season is on right now. Now, it'll be a little while. I believe uh, the uh, Valor FC begin their season on the 1st of May. Um, and I was talking with some people in the organization today. You're gonna, it's going to look a little different this year. There's going to be some really neat things that they're adding to it. And we'll be planning a little WST outing with many of you at Valor coming up soon. Uh, but of course, for at least the next couple of weeks, I think everyone very interested in the direction of the Winnipeg Jets will be paying a close attention to these games, Reem. And uh, I don't know what to expect tonight. I mean, I hope it's not more the same from these last couple of games. And, and maybe the fact that it's against Truba and of course against Andrew Kopp, who's just 13 games into his new home in New York City with the Rangers, um, might bring out the best of a team that you know, frankly, uh, doesn't want a similar result and similar mood around the club than they had leaving those two ugly games in Florida. Yeah, the Jets have this quality that we've seen where just when you think um, it couldn't get worse, they come out and have a game which makes you think, hey, this is the team we thought we were getting coming into this season. And uh, I think it's definitely possible. We'll see that. I mean, I have no, I mean, I have no idea which, which team we're going to see. Um, I was looking at the, you know, projections from Dom, who's got the Rangers at a 64.2% chance to win. We can go to the cool belt line. So they're, and their implied goal total for the Rangers tonight is high. And we saw last time they had a lot of trouble beating Igor Shesterkin, who's the Vesna candidate for this year. So I do think, this isn't, I don't know if his opponent lines up with the Jets, but we've seen them play solid hockey before. So. Maybe they did um, learn something from, you know, the Florida trip where they got smoked. They're off the beach into the city and we'll see how they fare <laughs> at MSG. Yeah, I mean, I've said this plenty of times before. I'm sort of at peace with the season uh, and I've been there for a while knowing that this team wasn't going to be in the playoffs. And, you know, to me, I've said this over the final dozen games. Um, you want professional efforts. You, you want maybe some of the things that we've just heard over the last couple of games, post game from Paul Stastny and Nikolai Ehlers and Kyle Connor. Um, we'd like to see some of that on the ice, but make no mistake about it. It's a difficult situation. Uh, it sucks to be out of the playoffs. And it even more is, I think, um, you know, an issue when, you know, expectations were as high as they were. And, you know, the talent that many, myself included, believe is in that locker room is there right now. Just look at a daily face-off right now. Hellebuck is confirmed. Shesterkin unconfirmed right now for tonight's game. But it's a good segue to get into uh, checking out the lines for tonight's game. Uh, and by the way, we did do a new lock shop today, as we normally do on Tuesdays. Had a little bit of the golf, basketball for tonight. And, of course, tonight's action in the National Hockey League. Um, you got the Minnesota Wild in Montreal, minus 256 favorites, Jets and Rangers, Jets plus 172 on the money line. Uh, I don't know if you think this group can muster up a big bounce back after that weekend in Florida. Um, certainly some money to be made if they can pull it off. Rangers minus 204. Tampa, my God, Tampa. Well, this has actually come down. Tampa was minus 526, I think, when we did the lock shop. They're only a minus 476 favorite right now. Some of the numbers we've seen this year, although Detroit has pulled off some wins in very unlikely locales, certainly against Carolina this year. See what they have for Tampa tonight. Flyers and Leafs, Leafs minus 455. Panthers, the scoring machine that is the Panthers, winners of 10 in a row, and I believe 12 of 13, minus 196 against the Islanders. Calgary is in Nashville. I actually, I think I'm on the underdogs tonight. Calgary's played so well. Um, this is a big game for Nashville, though. Calgary won last night. They played in Chicago, traveled to Nashville over the course. I think this might be a good spot game for the Preds to get a win. I think I'm going to take the plus 108 on Nashville. Minus 122 on the Blues against the Bruins. Um, big game for the Kings. Huge game for the Kings. Re minus 164. They're in El Anaheim to take on the Ducks. I'm sure the Ducks would love to. And their rivals a loss in such a big game. We'll see what happens. And the Vancouver Canucks looking for seven in a row as they cling to very slim playoff hopes. They take on the Ottawa Senators. And uh, in a game of teams that have already made tee times, the Blue Jackets plus 109, Sharks minus 128. You know, one of the underreported stories um, in and around the league lately has been the St. Louis Blues, Remus. They have won... 
what, one, two, three, four, five, nine in a row and 11 of their last 12 Oof. and have been scoring at a crazy rate. They put up seven in the second period against the Predators in their last game. Uh, eight, six, six, four, six, four, four, five, six. Um, if the team total has been over for the Blues at three and a half, uh, they've gone over 10 games in a row right now. It really is an incredible run for this team that I think is really well balanced. Maybe doesn't have the star power a lot of the other teams in the West right now. But I'll tell you what, the way that they're playing, uh, they're going to be a hell of an out. And they've just had some two big wins over the Minnesota Wild over this streak as well. And it's, I think, very likely that those teams could go head to head in round number one. Yeah, I've seen some of the advanced numbers saying that St. Louis may not necessarily be as good as their record is, but I, I like their roster. Robert Thomas, he's emerged as a premier passer. The Buchnevich trade I thought was a steal in the offseason. Remember emerged. when Tarasenko was done too? Yeah, remember when yeah, the uh, Seattle didn't take him. They took, uh, they took Vince Dunn. Uh, he's having, you know, good, Ryan O'Reilly, always one of the top uh, defensive centers. And then on the third line, Jordan Cairo, he's had a great season, but he's, oh. on, he's on the third line with Barbashev and Shen. So they have three lines, very balanced. Uh, defense, I think, has been strong. They acquired Nick Letty. Um, Tori Krug's been easy back. You know, Justin Falk's having a good season. They're all, all good. And they, I think Billy Huso's kind of emerged as their goalie. So I, I do like the Blues. They're kind of like a just solid throughout is how yeah i, I mean they basically them. have uh, they've got what one two three four they've got six players with 50 or more points sorry eight players with 50 or more points yeah. they basically have four point a game players including kairu who's one point short um and tarasenko every time i look at him with 33 goals and 76 points i just think of how lucky and happy st louis is that uh his contract it's, didn't get picked up by the kraken I mean, they were basically looking to ship him anywhere in the offseason, and people were so nervous about the injuries and the seven and a half million he was owed. It had been pretty well money, money well spent this year for uh, for the Blues. Uh, as far as baseball goes tonight, big slate of games, but we will focus in on this Blue Jays game against the Boston Red Sox. A six ten start, Jays with Kikuchi on the hill plus one thirty underdogs. Red Sox minus one fifty nine. And I always like looking at the team total for these games. Jay's team total, four and a half. If you think they can score five runs, uh, you'll get plus 110 on your money, of course. Uh, all these numbers available over at CoolBet. Check out today's edition of The Lock Shop. Subscribe to The Lock Shop wherever you get your podcasts. And if you are a first-timer over at CoolBet, use the promo code WST on your first deposit for a 100% bonus up to $200 over at coolbet.ca. Uh, going to be a good sports watch in night tonight, Reem. We kind of go back and forth between the hockey game and the baseball game, get them on both. And, of course, we do have playoff basketball, which will continue. But I did want to mention the Raptors loss last night before we finished up the program. Tough start for Toronto, but I will remind people, same thing happened a couple years back. They lost the first two against Milwaukee, came back and won in six. I'm I will be all over the Raptors in game three at home. Uh, and I do think that they can tie this series up, make it a best of three. And I still think we're going the distance. We'll wait and see, but I was enjoying flipping the channels last night. We had the late hockey. I was watching uh, Braves, Dodgers, Freddie Freeman homering on the first at bat of his return uh, or first, sorry, first game against his former team. Yeah. Hockey bat is a great time of year. So, uh, I'll be flipping the channels uh, tonight as well. Well, tomorrow will be a big show. We'll uh, have the latest from the Winnipeg Jets as they move from NYC to Carolina. Murata Tesh is going to join us. And by the way, check out The Athletic. Murat's got his new piece up. I'm going to be reading that after the show today. We'll be talking about it tomorrow. But he was very excited with that tease a little earlier last week for us. And uh I tell you what, it's always great having Murat on the program, but uh, I think it'll be a very interesting piece tomorrow when we talk about it with them. And then, of course, we've also got this. Uh, the bit, by the way, the piece is on Josh Morrissey, and I mean Josh Morrissey, one of the most, um, you know, well-spoken young men that has been through a lot. So um, check that out right now. I know we just put it out uh, earlier today, so we'll get to all of that tomorrow. A uh, little bit more on the, uh, the Blue Jays series, Raptors as well as they get ready for uh, game number three back at home. 
in Jurassic Park. And uh, of course, one more road game for the Winnipeg Jets and then four more home games until the lockers are cleaned out and we get on to the much-awaited offseason for the Winnipeg Jets. Been a great show today. Big thanks to Andrew Stoughton, who joined us, Mike McIntyre, and of course, James Patrick, head coach of the ice. If you missed that, head back to the start of the program. Great conversation about a really talented young ice team that has been the number one team just about all season long in the Western Hockey League and will begin their playoffs Friday and Saturday night at the Ice Cave. Tickets available at winnipegice.ca. Um, and a huge thanks to all of our sponsors. Aikens Lake, again, Check out my Twitter, incredible summer jobs for some young people. If you're looking to spend you know, a few months in paradise, no fishing experience necessary as well. Akinslake.com on Twitter and, uh, or sorry, Akinslake.com on the internet and at Akinslake on Twitter. <clears throat> uh, Wallace and Wallace, F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Breezy Bend, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course, our friends over at Cool Bet Canada. Folks, that's going to do it for us. Enjoy this game tonight. We'll see you tomorrow, 1 o'clock. Murata Tesh will join us. Should be a great one. We hope to see you then. Have a great night. Enjoy the games. We'll catch you next time on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.